Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples on a, you know, I hate to say it, it's a miserably humid Florida morning. The temperature is not horrific. It's probably 80, uh, but the humidity is already here, and by the time noon rolls around, it's just going to be crap, and uh, I know that's going to be an ongoing thing. July is coming, August is coming, uh, the worst of the months are ahead of us, and probably my least favorite time of the year. And what are you going to do but keep going? So uh, we'll do that. But uh, okay, so real quick, it's been a while since I did a video. I apologize for that. More than a week. Uh, you know, I did that little trip to North Carolina to pick up a few cars, which I did. Uh, I'm going to try to pick up a couple more today. Uh, in Naples uh, through uh, a friend of mine. We found some a uh, couple of interesting bits, so we'll see if we can't get those. And we should have a pretty good run of fun cars coming up to do videos on. Uh, hopefully they also sell so I can replace them and get something else, but uh, we do have some fun stuff coming up. Uh, today, I've got this 2007 Porsche Cayman S, uh, which frankly is a little bit generic for the stuff that I do. I mean, it's, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's not a 1977 Chrysler Cordoba or something. I mean, this is, you know, a car that's much more mainstream. Uh, but every now and then I get asked, you know, what car would you own? What car would you drive? What car would you have? What do you have? And the answer to that is a Silverado pickup truck, which, by the way, I've also replaced uh, with a very similar Silverado pickup truck. I'll do a video on that soon. I did a video on the old Silverado uh, a while back, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of getting long in the tooth and didn't have the punch I needed to do some new stuff. So well, anyway, we'll get into that. I'll do a review of the new one, but uh, it's going to be hard for some people to tell the difference, and that's great. That's exactly the way I planned it. But, uh, but anyway, so you, people ask, what would you drive? What, what's your favorite car? You know, that's tough. How do you name that? I mean, it's like, you know, asking... Uh, a musician what his favorite song is. I mean, there's uh, there's just too many to choose from, too many great bits out there in the world. But I have to say, in the top five is going to be this uh, Cayman S, this 2007, 6, whatever, this first generation Cayman. Uh, to me, and others may disagree, and if they do, they could go to hell, is the last great classic Porsche. And uh, I will stick by that, and I will fight it to the death. And I'm not even one of these real Porsche guys, you know? I mean, I can respect what Porsche is, and what they did, and what they do, uh, but I'm not one of the diehards, not even close. In fact, I probably make more fun of them than anything else. They're not quite as bad as BMW guys, but they're pretty bad. Uh, but, uh, you know, I do get what Porsche is all about. And, of course, they, for many, many decades, have been building sports cars that are beloved by a lot of people. The Cayman S came out in 2006, and it bucked Porsche's system a little bit. For one thing, uh, it was only the S model that was released when it came out. It wasn't the uh, standard entry model, uh, which uh, came out the year after. Uh, also, it was a tin top version, and they don't like hearing this, but it's true, uh, a tin top version of the uh, second generation Porsche Boxster, uh, which cost more than the Boxster, thus bucking the trend of convertibles costing more than the coupes uh, because of course you have this sort of big complex top-down mechanism going on a car of course that's going to cost more than just uh, a tin roof but Porsche did add a bunch of stuff to this car uh, to justify it being more expensive than the uh, Boxster beneath it uh, the Boxster of course at least initially being hated by the purists and uh, finally maturing into the uh, really rather nice and lovely car that it became and remains today. But I think the first gen is the way to go. And to me, okay, let's say you take um, uh, Ferdinand Porsche, you know, the original, you know, engineer that, that built Porsches. And, you know, we'll get into his history just a tiny bit. I'm not going to go crazy on this video. But if you brought him back from the dead and, you know, had him look at everything Porsche made from after his death till current, I have a feeling that this is the last car he would have recognized. This is the last car that would have made sense to him. Uh, you know, you get into sort of the fighter jet style, highly technological 911s that came afterwards, and he might appreciate the engineering and respect 
respect what they did. Uh, but they did lose some of the classic analog feel that uh, is what made Porsche what it is today. It's the roots of Porsche. Uh, was a pure sports car. And this Cayman S, despite having a few little bits of electrical and digital accoutrements, uh, really is the last true analog sports car that Porsche made. And uh, I absolutely love it. And it would be on my top five list of cars that I would have to own personally. There's a few <laughs> others, of course, but uh, the Cayman Z. And in terms of being the sports car, you know, eh, it's like a Miata on steroids. And I'm going to get some flack for that, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, the Miata is also a true honest sports car. And uh, the Cayman just sort of improves on that theory by tenfold. Uh, the styling of the car is quite stunning. And it harkens back to many classical Porsches. Uh, I think primarily you've got the 550 Spider, Not from this angle, not from the front. Much more from the back with those big haunches. Uh, over the rear wheels and the uh, drooping uh, hatchback going into a, you know, lovely little tail end there. I think that's very reminiscent of the 550 Spider. Uh, you also have some of the uh, 904 uh, in the design, and I think that's also part of what makes this a classic car. You know, I'm going to say very few cars are thought of as masterpieces the day that they emerge, the day they come out. And uh, this came in, eh, I think it, it qualifies. It was one of the cars that was... Uh, widely thought of as being uh, perfect on the day it released. It's not something that they came out, people liked it, they drove it, and then eventually they thought it started thinking of it as epic and wonderful. I mean, it, it got everything from the day it was built. And uh, if you're looking for something that's going to be a collectible classic car in the future, a collectible classic Porsche, look no further. I mean, the Cayman S uh, is going to be a beloved piece for many, many, many years to come. And uh, it's only going to go up in value. But uh, anyway, so let's just start getting into this thing. I think I have the key here. We're going to start in the frunk. And it's a word that I hate. Absolutely. I get it. You know, front trunk. Uh, let's shorten that and make it a frunk. Oh, stupid. Anyway, press the key on this. Uh, I'm going to button on this key and then we'll get in here. All right, so what you get in here is some nice storage space. It's uh, deep, it's uh, a good size. You're gonna be able to fit your infants and toddlers in there with no issues at all. Uh, they could even stand on their feet, and you know, even when you close the hood, you're not gonna hit their little head. So it's, it's a nice place to stuff them. And uh, of course, uh, you know, behind this little panel here, I'm sure we're gonna find all the tire changing stuff. Now that's where the uh, tire changing and the amplifiers for the, uh, the Bose radio, so you know, very neatly tucked up stuff from Porsche. Very good engineering and design on this. I'll get that in later. And uh, all very lovely in the frunk. So let's get that back down. Uh, the proper way to close that is just let it drop, click into place, and then put your hand over that Porsche emblem and give it a little push. You don't want to slam that. Uh, it's uh, not going to bode well for the car. Have a look here in the back. And here we've got more luggage room, and that's uh, nice stuff. So you've got the same uh, basic trunk from the Boxster has survived. Uh, you also get this middle area up there on top of the uh, flat six engine uh, that sits amidships in this car. And while that is a departure for Porsche, I mean, they weren't known for mid-engine cars. I think they've made a few race cars over the years. Uh, their street cars have generally been ass engine, like the 911 and, uh, well, you know, like the 911. So, uh, that's that's something they've historically done for years. Uh, making this car mid-engine was quite a sea change and uh, a very dangerous move for Porsche in some ways because, uh, you know, when you get into the 911, it's a thing that was created 50 years ago. People loved it. They absolutely loved it, but it had this inherent design flaw of hanging the heavy engine behind the rear axle. Uh, so it, it was lethal, especially when you get into the higher horsepower versions. I mean, you want to talk about, you know, snap throttle over spear. I mean, it's going to kill you. And it, in fact, there was a class action lawsuit uh, when the original uh, 911 turbos came out in the 70s because they were really, really hard to control when pushed to their limits. The SN would just snap around and you'd end up crashing into something and a bunch of orthodontist wives end up, um, you know, end up six feet under so uh, it was a dangerous car so uh, essentially the 911 had this big design flaw terrific sports car but Porsche 
tried to correct the design flaw for 60 years with a variety of suspension tweaks and uh, finally electronic engineering and traction controls and this and that and the other uh, to minimize the uh, really the incorrectness of hanging the engine over the SN like the Beetle uh, originally and of course that's where we get into you know Dr. Porsche and where he came from uh, apparently a nice young Hungarian guy with an aptitude for engineering uh, never really formula trained for Formula, geez. <sighs> Never really formally trained. Uh, he snuck into a few college classes to get some tidbits, but you know, more or less just a high school guy. And uh, he came up through the ranks of different companies. In fact, uh, he helped to create the first electric uh, gasoline hybrid uh, car, the first on record, and uh, then went on to do more engineering. It was quickly noticed by the powers that be in Germany and uh, eventually became uh, Hitler's favorite <laughs> engineer. So, you know, this you're probably not going to find this stuff on the Porsche website, but uh, he was instrumental in, uh, you know, helping the Nazi war machine with he made a tank, uh, which was a, a version of the Tiger tank, which was originally um, going to be, you know, of course, mass produced and used in the war, but it proved to be too complicated. He was a bit of a nut. Uh, so it became some kind of a big gun thing instead. It was called the Ferdinand after him, and it, it was used in uh, much lighter um, uh, numbers than the actual Tiger tank, which came from another engineer. Uh, and uh, the Ferdinand was, you know, very powerful, great gun, but apparently it was so hard to maintain, most of them ended up getting blown up by their own operators so the enemies wouldn't get hold of them because it ended up needing a set of spark plugs or something. I'm sure a lot of Porsche guys uh, who take their car to the shop can sympathize. Uh, but anyway, he was part of the big Nazi war machine, eventually uh, joined, the, uh, joined the Nazi party, became an Uberfuhrer uh, on the SS, so he had a pretty high rank, and uh, Hitler... They decreed him to build the people's car. Hitler wanted to motorize Germany, and he looked to his uh, favorite little engineer guy, Mr. Ferdinand Porsche, who essentially came up with the original Volkswagen Beetle, uh, which, uh, of course, Porsche 911s were loosely based on for years afterwards. And uh, it proved quite a success and worked out very well for, uh, well, you know, not, not entirely. After the war, the French took him. Uh, uh, they wanted him to work on a Beetle that would be made in France. Uh, French engineers and companies went ape shit over that. They didn't want him there. They didn't want that happening. They're very proud of their French-only heritage. Uh, so instead of having him help on a French Beetle, they just threw him in prison. So he was in there for 22 months until his uh, family came up with a way to pay some ransom and get him out. And uh, back he went to Germany. And uh, at that stage, Volkswagen started giving him royalties on the Type 1 Beetle. So. Uh, he made some money and had a, uh, a decent life, but then he had a stroke a few years later, never really recovered, and I want to say he died in 1951, and uh, it was his son and the rest of his family who kept the company going. Uh, in fact, his son was the one who came up with the first Porsche 356, uh, which, uh, you know, they made a bunch of steel-bodied ones. They kind of cobbled them together. They had no money uh, because the uh, factory, the Porsche factory, was being held by the Allies for uh, war reparations. They had no collateral, so banks wouldn't help them out. Uh, so they went around to Volkswagen dealers and said, look, we'll build these 356s. Here's one. I think you're going to like it, uh, but you got to pay for them in advance. And uh, that did happen. They did pay for some in advance. That funded more being made. They originally planned to make 1,500, and uh, over the next 17 years or so, it became like 38,000. So uh, the 356 is where it all took off for Porsche. Anyway, there's a uh, quick little nod to uh, where they all came from. And again, probably not something you're going to read about on the Porsche website. All the forced labor and the Polish and the Russians and whatnot. <laughs> Anyway, you know, no matter where you go, you're going to find it. Uh, history is written by the winners, of course. So you go to Japan, you're going to find Toyota and Nissan and all these companies had a little bit to do with the uh, uh, the Japanese war machine. Uh, you know, if America had lost World War II, which thank God we did, because German I find to be a very difficult language to listen to, and we'd all be speaking it now, uh, then probably there would be trouble for the Americans who had been part of Ford and GM and Chrysler and, you know, whatnot. So 
So uh, anyway, there it is. And uh, there we'll keep going from here. Uh, simplicity. Again, when you had Colin Chapman from Lotus, you know, one of the great racing engineers of all time. Uh, he, what was his famous thing? He said, you know, first of all, simplify and then add lightness. Uh, that was uh, Colin Chapman's uh, vision for, you know, racing cars. And Porsche did take that to heart uh, when building this Cayman. Uh, for one thing, the chassis is 150% stiffer than the Boxster with the tin top. And when the chassis is that stiff, uh, you can use much stiffer suspension in the front and back without sacrificing ride quality. Uh, and that is part of the perfection of the Cayman. That's how they were able to do that. Uh, also, they used the very simple generic interior, partially from the Boxster with a few Cayman tidbits thrown in. Uh, but it's a simple, simple car. The seats are lightweight. The steering wheel is Cayman only, but it's light. Uh, it's not loaded with buttons and gadgets and gears. It has simple analog gauges, a simple little center stack, and uh, it works very well. It's lighter than the Boxster, which makes it, of course, uh, handle better on the racetrack. And uh, we'll get into how good it is doing that later. Never mind in and out of track. Forget that. I mean, man, this car is epic to drive, but it is just absolutely beautiful inside to look at and uh, very, very simple. I love the big air vents on the side uh, feeding the motor. Uh, it's a 3.4 liter flat six. And here's where it gets interesting because Porsche wants to position the car uh, back in 07 or 06 between the Boxster and their 911. Uh, the Boxster is 50 grand, the Cayman 60 grand, and the entry level Carrera is like 70 plus grand. So, uh, this is going to fit right in the middle of it. And to justify the cost over the price of the Boxster, uh, they took the 3.2 uh, from the Boxster S. They bored it over a little bit to 3.4. Uh, they used the same heads from the Boxster S, but they took the cams from the Carrera, uh, which were uh, a Vario cam setup, and that beefed everything up to 295 horsepower, which was a little more than 20 uh, over uh, what the Boxster S had, but a little under the 3.20 or so that the uh, Carrera had. So um, again, they, they did a perfect job in making the engine just fit right in the middle of the Porsche lineup, right where it's priced. And a lot of people cried. They said, man, this thing could use another 100 horsepower. And it could, but they did not want it to infringe uh, on the uh, dominance of the 911. They just couldn't make it faster than the 911. What would be the point? <laughs> Nobody would buy the 911. They'd, they'd buy the uh, Carrera, the uh, uh, the Cayman instead, so yeah, there it is. They, uh, you know, they were pretty well bound uh, having this great chassis, but they couldn't bring it to its full potential because uh, had they done so, it would have uh, cut into their sales on the uh, much more expensive Carrera. Uh, the Cayman, by the way, is named after a crocodile, not the islands. Uh, it's some sort of South American crocodile with skinny little mouth and big teeth, and thank God we don't have any of those things around here. Although I will say, if we had one, maybe they'd have gone after the goats, but... That said, I don't think we're going to be seeing goats anymore. I haven't seen them since that day that they were standing on top of the Boxster, and I have a strong suspicion we're not going to see them uh, in the future, so uh, probably it's safe to just say goodbye to the goats. Uh, I tell you what I'm going to do here. I'm going to pause the video so I can get the uh, crap in the back of this thing, get my license plate on it, and uh, then we'll do a little test drive on the way into work. Uh, real quick, though, look at the beautiful brake setup in this car. Uh, you could get a ceramic brake option, but it was like eight grand and nobody opted for it. Uh, also, brake jobs would end up costing thousands, so uh, you had to be a real diehard nut for that. Uh, there were also like four optional 19-inch wheels. I can't remember what these ones are called, but I think they're the best looking of them. And uh, the guy who owned this thing, this is the 18,000 mile uh, one owner Cayman S. I mean, this is the holy grail of Cayman S's in my mind, the uh, guards red over black with uh, the kind of owner who kept it in a tiled and air-conditioned garage with a bunch of Porsche, you know, cleaning supplies on a shelf and polished it up on the weekend. So, you know, if you want one to put in a collection and not use really the way that Porsche intended, uh, this is probably the one to do it with. Anyway, I'll get my crap in there and we'll uh, go for a spin. All right, so as long as we're talking about top five favorite cars, uh, wedged in here a little bit awkwardly is Peter's uh, late 80s 560 SEC. I want to say it's an 87 or 88. 
And that is another one of my top five. It's weird the two German cars top the list. I mean, obviously, I've been doing German cars for years, but uh, the, the American Iron is where my love really is, with the great exception of the uh, Cayman S and, uh, of course, a uh, 126 Coupe like this one. You, could, you know, you could almost add a 123 Wagon as well. So I might have to expand the list a little bit and uh, get make it a top 10 because, you know, we're getting full already with three German cars and we barely even got started. But uh, this is another car I'm going to be doing a review of down the road uh, if I uh, can put it together. But, you know, not for a while because I got a bunch of cars I got to sell first before I'm doing ones that aren't for sale. Anyway, let's keep going. Nope, we got honks. Uh, so I'm getting honked at this morning and... <laughs> spoken to but the hell with it oh man look at the beautiful way that whole tail end comes together on this car i love the little twice pipes at the bottom you know in the center uh the little bumperettes and body color the cayman s script on the back uh this is a little spoiler i have to be careful with this and pull it down uh at 75 miles an hour that's going to raise three inches uh to help stabilize the car and uh, does work very, very well. But I just love the way that bubble roof swoops down in between those bulging muscular fenders and creates something reminiscent of a modern 550 and really seals this car into being what I think is gonna be uh, just as collectible as any classic Porsche from the past. You know, maybe not in terms of numbers because they would have made more than a 550 Spider, but certainly in terms of styling, performance, driving, and the way the car goes down the road it's oh god it's such an epic fun car to drive it really really is uh, okay door panels nice and simple uh, you've got these sort of swoopy looking jet air intake things for the pull handles you've got eight airbags in this car uh, the S came standard with the Bose surround system nice little stitched leather that reminds me of 80s Porsches and all the door panel stuff I don't think this was ever opened it's so tight and you know there's even dust under there and this guy was pretty anal but uh, that's a nice place to put some handguns you get a big revolver in there or, uh, pretty much any uh, you know 9 or 10 mil or 40 you want no issue at all uh, over here you've got uh, just a very standard uh, headlight control uh, not automatic which is just fine with me I like having control over my headlights uh, you also get the Le Mans style uh, Porsche ignition tumbler on the left um, which again doesn't really make sense anymore uh, because in the old days you could reach in and turn the key without touching anything but now of course there's safety switches on the clutch so you have to have that pushed in to start it but um, uh, yeah, anyway it's all tradition and we have so few traditions left we may as well keep the ones that are still around and celebrate them all right seatbelt on I'm gonna leave the door open as I crank it up all the mechanical whirring and clanking and gear noise and uh, you know they've they've replaced the sound of the big uh, air-cooled engine fan uh, with uh, you know gear noise but they still do a really nice job uh, of making the uh, Porsche sound uh, in this car in a very classic way and that is of course part of the experience let's get a little AC going because it is crappy crappy hot today uh, here you see a beautifully laid out instrument cluster very very simple the gauges are in gray which they're not in the Boxster or the 911 that's a Cayman thing uh, you've got your 190 mile an hour speedo uh, with no indicator for like 55 or 65 so Porsche isn't you know preaching to you about speed limits which I really like uh, it's also sort of an afterthought compared to the tack which is the front and center gauge which of course is what you'd want for racing and uh, that does uh, harken to Porsche's sporty lineage, so I do appreciate that as well. Uh, there you see just 18,000 miles on the clock, and again, I mean, this thing is... It's ridiculous. Uh, anyway, you've got uh, driver information centers beneath the three gauges. Over here, you've got your fuel and your uh, water temp, uh, your outside temperature and your clock. Uh, in the center here, you can uh, go through very different things. So the TPC, that's, uh, uh, there we go, that's our tire pressure. Um, <laughs> zero and negative four, I'm not sure that's correct. They were reading in the 30s yesterday. Maybe that's just off the uh, where they're supposed to be. So um, I have to put four pounds in that one. Let's go forward No, I'll go back. All right, so here we've got set. Let's reset that. Uh, chrono, oh, a limit that, where you could set your speed limit. Uh, info, no messages, that's probably what you want. Oil, 
uh, measurement only possible with engine off. So that's your dipstick. So you don't have to get underneath that big cover in the back. And here's something interesting, the Sport Chrono, uh, which a lot of people think is just a stopwatch on your dashboard. And well, you know, it is. You can time a lot of different things there, and like how long it takes the idiots at the drive-thru to get your food ready, or uh, you know, how long it takes your wife to come out from uh, the house after you're ready and in the car waiting. So you can time that. In fact, we uh, push this guy forward, stopwatch, start timing. And there we go, that thing lights up. It gives you a digital timer and an analog timer on top of there. Uh, you get a pretty, uh, um, you know, you get it also duplicated down there in digital. Uh, you can do intermediate times, which, you know, that'll be laps, individual laps, or individual segments of laps if you're a race guy or uh, God knows, again, what else it is that you want to time, so you can do all that with that. Uh, more interesting is the sport part of the sport chrono. So when you press that, uh, what that does is change things a little bit. It changes the throttle response on the car, so now it's going to have a much stronger tip in. Uh, it uh, detunes uh, the PSM a little bit, Porsche Stability Management. Uh, it sets the limits further away so the traction control will not kick in until it really thinks you're about to die. Uh, you can also turn that off entirely, although I suspect in traditional German style it's going to come on if it thinks you're dying again. Uh, and it also changes the rev limiter from a soft one to a hard one. And what that, you know, the rev limiter, the thing has a 7300 uh, RPM red line, which I don't think you need. I mean, it really does reach peak power in the mid sixes, but uh, if you hit the rev limiter with the uh, sport off. Uh, it retards the timing. Uh, every time I say that, I think of Dalton, but uh, it retards the timing. It cuts off uh, fuel and uh, very gently will uh, not let you exceed the uh, maximum allowable revs where engine damage would occur. Uh, when the uh, sport button is on, it's now a hard shut off. It's giving you full power all the way to redline, and then it starts cutting shit off when you hit it. So it's much more uh, race like and violent, and yeah, part of that sport package. Uh, this is your door locks. You get these nice vents for air conditioning. Uh, very simple AM FM. Um, and of course, we got nothing but uh, commercials. Let's see if we go this way. Wonderful. I mean, this is why I just can't listen to the radio anymore. It's absolute crap. Uh, you've got heated seats here. You've got your climate control. You can raise or lower your rear spoiler manually with that. Uh, instead of the five-speed Tiptronic, this one comes equipped with the very traditional six-speed manual gearbox that came from the box dress and works great. Uh, you've got, this is one of my complaints about this car. I don't like their cup holder setup. Uh, it's got this long, fragile thing that breaks on high mileage beater examples. And uh, bends in the middle a little bit so it doesn't quite line up at the edges if you ever use it so uh, not my favorite cup holder setup but yeah you know properly German overcomplicated and likely to break so as far as that goes they hit the mark uh, here you've got some places to store CDs you got a nice set of books in here and uh, all very simple and lovely and of course beautiful austere humorless German leather everywhere uh, including on the uh, e-brake we also have an ashtray because German still smoked in 2007 and another great little spot to put a, you know, a very small little uh, nine millimeter that you could fit in there to keep yourself safe and uh, there's a 12 volt outlet and a place to put coins and uh, maybe just a couple little bags of drugs, nothing major. Let's go for a spin. I'm stopping. I'm gonna, I don't want the new lap. You see, this kind of stuff is kind of silly. All right, stop timing, reset. I like the way it looks when it resets. And we're going to start timing then when we go for a drive. Uh, up here, you have a self dimming mirror. Works great. And also that uh, home link garage door opener. So, uh, And this is funny, too. We bought the car yesterday from the guy. That's how clean it was. I wouldn't even let Dalton touch it. Uh, he left. <laughs> He left his garage door opener in here, which we're going to give to him. Didn't even notice that till just now. But that's how people are. I mean, here is a built-in, elegant garage door opener. And uh, rather than program it, people just slap, a, slap the one their garage door came with up there. Oh, I love the way that sounds. You get a lot of engine noise in the uh, Cayman compared to the Boxster. I think it's definitely up a few notches, and I'm sure that's by design. Uh, Porsche definitely wanted to make the Caymans feel a little more sportier. 
made for these gates that everyone in the comment section says are very slow and <laughs> they're not wrong. I feel like I need to shave again by the time they open. You know, we'll sneak out there and uh, yeah, again, we got the sun there. I think, you know, let's see how this guy did on his windshield. Yeah, again, better than Dalton does after cleaning it, but still, uh, it's going to be a little foggy. So we'll wait to the end of the street and I'll pick it up again. All right, so I'm going to time our trip into work. Uh, chrono, there we go. All right, map time going. We got the stopwatch going. Away we go. You know, when that Vario cam kicks in, man, do you get a cacophony of lovely intake noises and exhaust noises and whirring noises. And again, all the stuff that made Porsche uh, so beloved for so many years. You know, I could bitch at it. I could say it's been designed to be that way uh, as a, because that's what people want and not because that's the way it ended up after engineering. But I forgive Porsche for that. It works too good uh, to, uh, to argue with. Uh, Driving-wise, I... I mean, look, if you take this car to your local autocross or PDX track day, uh, it's like taking Ginger Rogers to the church dance or Yo-Yo Ma, you know, to play a duet at the Tamman Show. 95% uh, or more of your everyday drivers are never going to come anywhere close to reaching the incredible limits of this car. Uh, you know, at home I have a, uh, a, a, a the Smith & Wesson Long Barrel 22 Target Target rifle, kind of competition target pistol, and when I have it, I'm like a surgeon at the at the. I can hit the bullseye from you know like a hundred yards without even thinking about it because it's just such a perfect gun for shooting targets, and that's the way this car is. It's such a perfect car uh, for going around a road course or racetrack. Uh, it can make even the most incompetent boob look like Michael Schumacher, you know, before the accident. Uh, it's just that good. The car is that. That good uh, mid-engine perfectly balanced uh, you can turn in with the precision of a surgeon uh, it's got variable power steering up front that really tightens in sport mode and it's just a incredible car uh, to move around a road course or racetrack really really epic nothing finer and uh, that's a big part of the charm of the Cayman I'm gonna have to sneak in here somewhere, do a jerk merge. Let me see if I can. I think I got room here. They're not gonna like it, but man, what the hell. Uh, anyway, so they joy to drive, and that's why it's on my top 10 list. And uh, I wish we could do a little bit more road racing or something so you could see it, but uh, it'll run zero to 60 in a little under five seconds, which is very quick. Quarter mile time in the low 13s. Uh, top speed of 171, uh, which is uh, nicely in tune with the uh, speedometer. And to me, it's just one of the great classic sports cars uh, of, yeah, of all time, you know, really genuinely. You have to put it up there. It is everything that a sports car is supposed to be. And uh, I do believe, to me, the last great classic Porsche uh, that uh, the original, you know, old Uber Fuhrer would recognize. This thing would make a lot of sense to him, even if the mid-engine thing was a bit strange. Uh, so it's uh, it's just an epic, epic car. Uh, appreciate you having a look. Uh, we got some real fun stuff coming up. I mentioned that before. We actually have a Chrysler Cordoba, finally got a Cordoba, so we should have some fun with that. Uh, I got the world's nicest 420 SEL on the way, and uh, some other uh, some other interesting stuff. Even a Dodge Daytona IROC. <laughs> we'll see how that goes, and uh, it'll be fun for the next few days. So, thank you for having a look. Really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to put down the camera and start enjoying my drive into work without getting a ticket, which I did on this trip, by the way, in a little <laughs> little Woods town in Georgia when I decided to get off the highway uh, all these you know decreasing speed limits one after the other I missed a sign from 45 to 35 and this uh, like 12 year old cop he looked like he was in a Halloween costume instead of a real proper cop writes me up for 47 and a 35 which to me is not in the spirit of catching a speeder uh, you know when you get a guy who thinks he's going 47 and a 45 so I don't know I think that's jerk like but 
who am I to argue with the revenue needs of a small town in uh, southern Georgia? Thank you for having a look. Really appreciate it. And we will see you with the next one. Take care.